The Mediterranean Sea, North Africa, the first to third centuries AD, the dazzling cities of Tripolitania. The northern shore of Africa, an area called Tripolitania, might seem to be a strange place to find some of the greatest architecture of the great Roman Empire. But it was here, in an exotic city called Leptis Magna, where great emperors like Hadrian and the African Septimius Severus built grand monuments to rival those in Rome. The history of this land goes back to ancient times, to 3,000 years ago, when the Phoenicians settled there. For years, archaeologists tried to unravel the mystery of why great cities in this region were developed to such an impressive degree, then abandoned, disappearing for hundreds of years. To uncover this mystery, we'll travel through Tripolitania between the first and third centuries AD, to a time when it was at the height of its splendor. The region of Tripolitania, or Tripoli, which is part of present-day Libya, faces the Mediterranean Sea. The name is from the Greek Tripolis, meaning three cities. Sabrata, Oia, where the present-day city of Tripoli exists, and Leptis Magna, the closest city to the desert of the Greater Syrtes. Why was this area the cradle of such flourishing development? In ancient times, sailors did not brave the open sea. The navigators who crossed the Mediterranean did so by staying close to the coast. This provided more security and shelter in case of a storm or shipwreck. But when they sailed alongside a desert, like the desert of the Greater Syrtes, having a shipwreck would have meant certain death. If survivors had reached land, they would find nothing but sand and salt water for hundreds of miles. So three cities were built next to the desert in the vicinity of rivers and safe landing places. Ancient historians reported that Tripolitania, a name given by the Romans, was founded by the Phoenicians. Following this and other clues, archaeologists excavated in search of those origins. In the area of Sabrata, they discovered this interesting tomb that confirmed the presence of Phoenicians and Punics in Tripolitania. The Punics were Western Phoenicians who founded cities such as Carthage almost 3,000 years ago. They built settlements throughout North Africa, as is proven by the numerous artifacts unearthed and now housed at the Museum of Leptis Magna. The first settlement of Leptis Magna was founded on a natural, inviting cove. The river Lebda flowed into the sea there, and in front were three large breakwater rocks that provided harbor from the fury of the sea, an ideal place to build the first port in the vicinity.
The busy port allowed the Punic settlement to prosper, and over the years, a beautiful and thriving Carthaginian city called Leptis was built here. After the Punic Wars in the first century BC, the three Carthaginian cities became part of the Roman Empire, and the Romans redesigned the city in their style. The new government brought in engineers to transform and expand the port to suit greater economic needs. They capitalized on the excellent location, realizing that the small primitive wharf could be expanded so that boats could be hauled ashore during winter when needed. They also built structures nearby where workers could repair ships and build new ones. Here at Leptis Mania, archaeologists discovered this monumental epigraph bearing the name Anabal to Papius Rufus, located at the entrance to the city market. As they excavated further, they found the name to Papius carved on other important public buildings in the city. Historical accounts make no mention of this personality, either among the politicians or among the military men or notables of the city. But the name to Papius had to be known by the Punics and Romans who lived in Leptismania. The practical Phoenicians and Romans would not have produced these inscriptions for no particular reason. Comparing these inscriptions with similar ones found at other sites, archaeologists realized that Topapius was an important wealthy family that patronized the arts. The signature of Anabal to Papius Rufus was also found in this magnificent theater, one of the first Roman theaters erected in masonry. Previous ones had been cut out of rock. Excavations brought to light other extraordinary buildings next to the theater. This four-sided portico was a gift of Itabal to Papias. Atop the theater, which dominated the city, there was the Temple of Ceres Augusta, adorned with Cipollino marble columns. It was a gift of Sufunibal, daughter of Anabal to Papias. It appears that during the first century AD, the Topapius and other families had a large income and contributed to make Leptismania a scintillating and impressive city. As trade grew, the old Phoenician port, modernized by the first Roman engineers, was no longer sufficient. The river mouth and the rocks that for centuries had provided Phoenician, Greek, and Roman ships safe harbor needed to be modified. New engineers were brought in and built a huge wharf on the western side of the river mouth. Then they joined the easternmost breakwater rock to the mainland. The new port brought more ships and more money, which meant arts patrons could offer more gifts to the city. This unearthed inscription bears the name of Itabal ben Kafada. It was placed at the top of a monumental building called the Chalcedius. The inscription, however, did not reveal what the building was used for. 
Archaeologists ruled out the possibility that it was a public place, temple, or home. As digging continued, the building turned out to be more and more impressive, but its purpose was still unclear until this strange plate emerged from the ground. By studying the find, archaeologists realized that it was a unit of measure and the building was probably used for some kind of trade. Subsequently, they discovered that it was a huge, luxurious bazaar where cloths were sold. Itabal Kafata was probably a merchant of fine cloths. Another fascinating discovery at Leptismania concerns this amphitheater, which seems to be sinking into the earth like a gaping chasm. It was not built on level ground, as was the practice at the time, but instead was dug out of rock. By translating the many inscriptions and comparing them with historical accounts, scholars realized that very few buildings erected at Leptismania in the first century AD, like the amphitheater, were constructed with public money from Rome, which was few and far between. So to make it easier and more cost efficient, the amphitheater was built inside an existing quarry from which stones were used to build the city. It was a practical solution to make a monumental structure with limited public funding. By and large, it was the generosity of wealthy private individuals who prospered with the trade of the region that gave Leptismania the magnificence it enjoyed at the time. Close to the end of the first century AD, however, income from trade started to drop off. Ships that had regularly paid a visit to the port of Leptis were declining in number and becoming smaller and smaller. This was common at wartime or on coasts where pirates roamed. But historians did not mention anything of this kind during that period. To solve this mystery, archaeologists focused their attention on the port again, and that's where they found the answer. Apparently, the decision by engineers to join the easternmost breakwater rock to the mainland was a bad one. Before the construction, tidal currents used to hammer the shore and carry away sand brought downstream by the river. After the construction, the currents were obstructed by the masonry work, Slowly but surely, sand built up so high in the port that it caused bigger ships to run aground, so trade dropped off. Although there was less wealth in the city, the inhabitants did not give up their love of comfort or beauty. When archaeologists found this dazzling statue, a copy of a famous Greek sculpture of Antinous, Emperor Hadrian's famous lover, they realized that something equally precious was probably hidden in the area. Excavations unearthed detailed floor mosaics and luxurious marble. The discovery made archaeologists think that it was the magnificent mansion of a wealthy merchant. However, when they compared the building technique with the architectural standards of the period, it led them to believe it was a more complex building. These small pillars, called suspensorae, raised the floor off the ground, supporting it. This technique revealed that the building was a bathhouse and that hot air used to circulate in the cavity created by the small pillars. By the time they had finished excavation, Archaeologists realized they had found one of the largest and better equipped baths of the Roman period. The baths of Hadrian of Leptismania in a class of its own. No other excavations of buildings in Leptis from the 2nd century AD revealed such marvelous statuary 
or rich mosaics. On the other end of Tripolitania stood Sabrata. This magnificent theater in Sabrata is also from the second century AD. The sculptures and bas-reliefs found even on the stage floor made archaeologists realize that it took a great deal of money to build it. This, along with other monuments and artifacts found here, suggest that Sabrata must have benefited from the recession at nearby Leptis Mania. This was proven correct when signs of the presence of a building belonging to Sabrata ship owners were found in Ostia, the ancient seaport of Rome. Most likely, city merchants here picked up much of the trade from nearby Leptis, and the resultant wealth led to the creation of these marvelous structures. But it is Leptis that seizes the archaeological day. For a long time, this triumphal arch at Leptis was the object of an unsolved mystery. In excavations over a long period, archaeologists unearthed, one by one, more than 2,000 fragments of statuary and bas-reliefs that adorned the arch. When the pieces were put together, they revealed figures that did not seem to have any meaning. And the stone slabs of the gables bore no inscription that could identify the historical event the arch was built to commemorate. Alessandro Ciuffi, an Italian sculptor, was asked to unravel this great mystery. Thanks to his expert eye and skill at recognizing the pliable lines of the marble, he was able to recompose a huge stone puzzle piece by piece. The work revealed these depictions of Sibylle, Venus Ashtart, and Melkart, the god of fertility and the sea, worshipped by the entire Punic world. In the middle, with the insignias of Jupiter, we find the historical personality to whom the arch was dedicated. Septimius Severus, Roman Emperor, born in Leptis Mania in 146 AD. This shows how important and connected to the empire this city must have been, since it had produced two emperors, Septimius Severus and his son Caracalla, or Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. In the third century, with Severus' descendants as emperors, the city experienced another period of splendor. Now Rome was sending public money that allowed residents to erect important new monuments. Perhaps the most majestic of the leftist constructions is this colossal forum. As was the practice in those days, the basilica was constructed adjacent to the forum. However, the buildings were not symmetric to each other. They were joined in the middle by a triangular construction. This lack of symmetry is hard to find in the Roman world. Archaeologists have explained this peculiar technique by the fact that the streets of the city of Leptis Mania had been designed by the Phoenicians, who didn't have the same orthogonal notion as the Romans. Aesthetically, however, it still worked. Inside the Forum and the Basilica, the eye perceived perfect symmetry according to the strictest principles of classical architecture. The temple that divided the colonnade was the place for worshipping a deified emperor. Historians searched to find out who it was dedicated to. Archaeologists reconstructed the city's history, establishing the different periods that buildings belonged to. What they found was that in the second century AD, under Emperor Septimius Severus and his son Caracalla, a whole new city was built and laid out on top of the old one, dazzling with marble and embellished with expensive sculptures and decorations. In short, it was mostly thanks to the Severus family that Leptis Mania recovered from the recession.
So the temple was dedicated to the glory of Septimius Severus and his family. On the opposite side of the temple was the basilica. The basilica was also constructed by the Severus family. Having an emperor who was born in your city meant that Leptis Mania received priority attention. Septimius Severus was proud of his African origin. He managed to climb to the highest position of Roman power, although he spoke very little Latin. He stayed devoted to his Punic language and culture, and thereby maintained a certain independence from Rome. The splendor that the Severus family bequeathed to Leptis has turned the city into one of the most beautiful archaeological sites of the Roman world. The basilica itself is the best preserved Roman basilica that has ever been discovered. A two-story building with three naves and two opposing apses. The upper galleries were reserved for women who were prohibited from the ground floor and to commoners who watched trials and other public activities. It was over 90 feet high. As the armies of Septimius Severus continued to wage brutal battles throughout the far reaches of the empire, it was here in his hometown where the emperor could find a semblance of peace and celebrate the perks of his position. Recently, not far from Leptis Mania, on the coast west of the city, archaeologists began removing great amounts of sand and mud and gradually discovered a large and unusually intact construction that clearly belonged to the Roman period. The location is called Selene, and what they uncovered was an ancient Roman villa. Inside, they found some of the most beautiful paintings and mosaics of North Africa. Extending their digs on the coast led to the discovery of an entire residential complex that is unique for its huge size and location. Excavations revealed a new villa facing the sea every 330 yards on a long stretch of the coastline. Indeed, it looked a lot like a resort colony today. Archaeologists guessed that this colony was probably a result of the problem Leptis was having with its sand-filled port. They thought wealthy inhabitants might have built private harbors up the coast next to their villas, ports that perhaps, over time, sunk into the sea. Yet when archaeologists went underwater, they found no remains of wharves or berths. They soon realized that the wealth of these settlements had not come from the sea, but from land. What had happened was, when the shipbuilding and related sea trade dried up, the citizens of Leptis entered into agriculture, cultivating grapes and olives. This new business once again brought well-being and progress to Tripolitania, and allowed the region to remain thriving and active until the period of the barbaric raids. One last mystery surrounding Leptis Mania still remains to be solved. Why is a city that is so beautiful and full of monuments still pretty much intact after devastating raids by the Vandals, Berbers, and Arabs in the late 3rd and 4th centuries? Why were building materials used in the constructions not carried off as they were from so many ancient cities, including Rome. Who saved Leptis Mania? Well, there is one theory. Leptis was for a long time called the City of White Shadows. White statues like ghosts used to appear and disappear in the moonlight, sometimes covered by sand dunes, at other times uncovered by the wind. 
The presence of these paranormal-like images might have frightened the new peoples of Tripolitania. So it turns out that the sand of the desert, the cause of the city's economic decline, was the same force that preserved it. The sand buried a lifestyle, then allowed for a resurrection. The sand and these sentinels, who have kept watch over Leptismania for centuries.